we, I told you about blood pressure. I said blood pressure is cardiac output times resistance. And I said the better way to figure out blood pressure is heart rate times stroke volume times resistance and take each one of them separately, figure out all the things that could affect heart rate, they could affect blood pressure. Things that could affect stroke volume could affect blood pressure. Things that could affect resistance could also affect blood pressure, right? Now, this is something else I want you to know. What is MAP? Everybody heard of the MAP? Okay, so you're, you're monitoring a patient's vital signs. You've got a patient in the emergency room. You've got a patient in the ambulance. You've got a patient on the helicopter, in the ICU, wherever. Yes, blood pressure is good to know, but in, when it comes to blood pressure, what we're really trying to figure out, is it normal, is it high, is it low? Do we need to do something about it? But probably a more um, diagnostic indicator would be the MAP or the mean arterial pressure. So the reason this is, is this is important is, for instance, let's say that the map drops. We need the map to be at least 65 millimeters of mercury to maintain end organ perfusion. But let's say the map goes, let's say it gets to 65 or goes below 65. Now we're definitely probably more than likely in a state of shock. OK, and they're all types. There are lots of different types of shock. But one thing they have in common is we will generally have a drop in the mean arterial pressure for some reason. Now, whether we're talking cardiogenic, anaphylactic, septic shock, or one of those distributive shocks, whether we're talking uh, neurogenic, where we have a loss of sympathetic tone, either way, our MAP is affected. Here's what I want you to know. How do you figure out MAP? Okay, yes, there's a calculation for it, but here's what I want you to know. MAP, to figure out the MAP, it's as easy as one, two, three. Say it with me. Map is as easy as one, two, three. Say it again. Map is as easy as one, two, three. What do you mean, Joshua? Well, watch this, guys. So map, if you want to figure out the map, if you want to figure out the mean arterial pressure at three o'clock in the morning in the back of an ambulance, in the helicopter, in the ICU, I mean, obviously the machine will give it to you, but let's say uh, for whatever reason, um, Maybe the, the number on the machine, it just doesn't seem right. You can actually figure out the map for yourself. It's as easy as one, two, three. We know that one plus two equals three, right? One plus two equals three. So all we're going to do, remember those two numbers of the blood pressure? Let's say we take 120 over 80 again. All we're going to do is we're going to take this top number, the systolic number. We're just going to put it right here. So one times the systolic number is the same as, let's just write it, the systolic number. So in this case, it'd be the 120, okay? All we're going to do is take this diastolic number and we're going to put it here, okay? So in this case, we have 80. So all we do is we take the systolic number, add to that twice the diastolic number, Add those together and divide by three. It's actually really simple. So in the case of a blood pressure of 120 over 80, we're going to take 120 plus 160. Add those two together. What's that? That's going to be uh, 120 and, and uh, 160. That's going to be 280 divided by three, roughly 93. The map is 93. Okay. Now, is that more than 65? That's good, right? <laughs> So it's not just that we need to look at the, for instance, the top number or the bottom number. What we really need to look at it in context of what kind of map does it give us? Remember, we need a mean arterial pressure of at least 65 millimeters of mercury to maintain organ perfusion, to keep those organs happy, to have enough pressure to get the blood and the nutrients to all the tissues that we need. OK. Now. So MAP is as easy as one, two, three. Take the systolic number plus twice the diastolic number, add those together, and just divide it by just the number three by itself, okay? Now, the next thing I want to talk about is CPP, also known as cerebral perfusion pressure. What's that? Well, that's the amount of pressure that's, for instance, keeping the, uh, the penumbra of the brain alive. So the brain has to have nutrients. Remember, for instance, the brain has to, it lives off glucose in, a, in normal times, in states of uh, stress, and then in states of extreme stress, the brain switches, for instance, from glucose as a source of energy to ketones as a source of energy. 
But in normal situations, the brain runs off glucose. Well, we need a certain amount of pressure to get, for instance, the glucose, the oxygen throughout the brain. And that's that cerebral perfusion pressure. How do you calculate cerebral perfusion pressure? Here's what I want you to know. All right, everybody look at me. Let's say you're going on a trip, right? So we're talking about cerebral perfusion pressure. But let's say you're going on a trip. <clears throat> Hang on. And so you're getting ready to go on this trip. You need to figure out where you're going. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to open up your map. <laughs> All right. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to open up your map. And then once you open up your map, then you're going to go in on the map. Now watch what I just did here. So I said, so back to the screen, I said, you're going to open up your map. What? Come on. Okay, you're going to open up your map. And then once you open up your map, then you're going to go in. What? What do I mean in? Well, we're going to go in. Okay. So, and this stands for intracranial pressure. Another way to say that is the ICP. So to figure out the cerebral perfusion pressure, we're going to take our map minus the intracranial pressure. So we're going to open up our map and then go in. You got it? So map minus intracranial pressure is cerebral perfusion pressure. Now, how would you figure that out? Well, I just told you how to figure out the map. We're going to map is as easy as one, two, three. We take one. I mean, we take the systolic number plus twice the diastolic number, add them together, divide by three. You got it? So now we know how to figure out the map. And then they would have an invasive line uh, that's monitoring, or that's giving you the measurement of their intracranial pressure. You just subtract those two numbers, map, map minus the intracranial pressure. So we start with our map, go in. So start with our map and go in. So map minus intracranial pressure is cerebral perfusion pressure. Everybody good with that? That was pretty cool, huh? I know, I know. I'm just warming up, guys. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna we're gonna uh, let's go ahead and kick it up a notch. In fact, so the very next thing we're gonna talk about is axis. Okay. Now, so I'm on page 43 of your workbook. All right. I'll tell you what, guys. So since we're getting since we're getting pretty close to the um, hour. Why don't we go ahead, because I don't want to stop in just a few minutes. Um, I want to be able to spend a little time on this axis. So we kind of introduced axis the other day, uh, but now we're going to really go into axis. I'm going to spend a little more time explaining it in terms of, so axis there again is the direction that the electricity is flowing in the heart. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a quick break. We'll take our 10 minute break. When we come back, I'm going to go all into axis. I'm going to tell you about left axis deviation, right axis deviation. We're going to talk about extreme right axis deviation, normal axis deviation. We're going to tell you, okay, what's making it happen? What are some possible causes? We're going to really go into this axis thing. So here's what we'll do. We'll go ahead and take our break. And when I see you back, we're going to start on axis. See you in just a moment.